So my name is Ronan Persh. Um, this is Sunny. Uh, we both from Blockchain at Berkeley. We are an organization at UC Berkeley that educate, um, educate the community, and we do also a few consulting uh, projects for companies in the industry. Um, we're gonna tell you a little bit about Monero and what we know. So obviously, Ricardo is a dev core. Uh, it's gonna be hard to compete with the stuff that he said. Um, but we're going to try to uh, be biased and tell you what we know about the technology and what it really is. Um, I hope that there's a few people that are technical. Um, we try not to be too technical, but if it is, um, you can also stop us and ask questions along the way. That's perfectly fine. Um, so let's start. So we're going to talk today about Monero, whether it's really anonymous. Uh, we're going to mention uh, mainly the new news that was recently released by Andrew Miller, um, the Monero Link uh, uh, website. Uh, an easy way of really thinking about Monero for, I mean, just an overview. Um, if you think about Bitcoin, um, it's really like, you know, me sending from my home address a mail to Sunny's home address, and it's very public and everybody knows. Where Monero, it's more like a PO box, so it's like, it's an anonymous box that you rent from the mail uh, post to the post office, and then I send a post uh, to, a, to a PO box of Sunny. He has a private key to it, but nobody knows who it really is, and he can send it to my PO box. Nobody knows really who it really is. Um, that's essentially the aspect of anonymity. Um, so let's start. So there's the two main com features that Monero essentially uh, present as the core features. Uh, one of them is unlinkability. So essentially, unlinkability um, discuss whether, if we have two transactions, whether we can trace and, and prove that they were sent to the same person. So if Sunny and Ronan are sending transaction, can we prove that George received both of them? Um, this is the first feature, but um, I'm actually gonna talk about the second feature, which called linkability. This is the core, uh, the core uh, uh, feature that the paper essentially talks about. The paper is called Empirical Analysis of Linkability, which linkability essentially asks, okay, assuming George sent out two transactions out to Sunny and Ronan, can we uh, prove that it came from George? Um, this is very common in the Bitcoin. Uh, as we all know, a Bitcoin is not anonymous if we send a transaction we can trace it back. Um, but Monero is supposed to solve that issue. Um, so this is what we talked about with the Bitcoin style. Um, Sunny received, uh, there's a, someone sent Sunny a message, uh, a, a transaction, Sunny received it. And then if Sunny spent it, you can go back and see that actually Sunny was the one that sent it. That's how Bitcoin works. I hope everybody kind of familiar with that. Um, if not, um, let us know. But I hope in, uh, in Greece people know what Bitcoin is. Uh, <laughs> so, yes, we do. <laughs> yeah, well, you guys need it. I mean, I think, I mean, I, I personally love Greece, and I think like there's going to be, there needs more adoption in Greece. So I really, I'm happy to see you guys really uh, pushing this uh, forward and this initiative. I'm also going to be in Greece, by the way, in a month. Um, so I'm, I'll come and visit you in the next meetup, that's for sure. Um, okay, so let's go to the Monero aspect. So in Monero, we have, um, we have a few transactions, a few public transactions, um, Ronan, Sunny, and Yorgo, okay? Now, in that case, let's, you, let's take Sunny as an example. Sunny decides that um, he wants to send a transaction out, but he doesn't want to be revealed. He wants to be anonymous. So what he does, he takes the Ronan's public key, uh, public key and George public key and he combines them together. What it means, it means essentially that's called mixing. Okay, so you take Sunny's public key, Ronan's public key, George's public key, and Sunny private key. As you can see under transaction E, um, it shows what the ring signature is. The mixing aspect, that's a term that you should all be aware, is essentially combining more than one public key into the ring transaction. And then when you send it out, 
there's going to be Sunny's private key that signs it. What it actually does is essentially saying, if I'm a third person looking at this transaction, I don't really know if the public, the private key come from Sunny, comes from Ronan, or comes from George. So from an external, if I look at a helicopter view, essentially there can be three people that send a transaction and I don't really know who that is. So there's 33% of actually me guessing whose transaction is. So what this process is called of the number of mixins that you include is the anonymity set. So we can compare this to two other currencies. Uh, this diagram is right from Andrew Miller's white paper. So he shows this diagram com comparing CryptoNote, which is what Monero uses, comparing it to Bitcoin. And of course, him being an advisor to the Zcash project, of course, wanted to include Zcash in, in the paper as well. So in Bitcoin, the transaction set is always of size one, because it's public and transparent which transaction output was used as the input for a new transaction. In Monero, in CryptoNote, which Monero uses, your anonymity set is variable and is chosen by the user. And in Zcash, which um, basically it, it uses all past transactions as part of the anonymity set. However, these three distinctions show an issue that CryptoNote users have to solve that's not really present in the other two uh, systems. In Bitcoin, how many possible anonymity sets can you create? You can only create one because you use the real transaction and nothing else. There's only one real transaction to choose from. In Zcash, how many sets are there to choose from? There's one because you choose the real transaction and every other transaction as your anonymity set. So there's one possible anonymity set. However, in CryptoNote, you choose one real transaction and a random number of mixing transactions. And you can, not only is your number of mixing transactions up to the user, but it's also which transactions you use as your mixing. So in this, you could, if you want to do two mixing, you could use any combination of two transactions in your crypto node. Uh, so the crypto node white paper itself does not actually discuss the methodology for choosing an anonymity set. This was a task that was left to the developers of the Monero implementation. And so the Monero linkability paper, Andrew Miller's paper, focuses on this question and points out some major flaws in the way that anonymity sets are currently created. So yeah, as we mentioned, um, the mixing aspect that we mentioned earlier, it's not in the CryptoNote white paper, which the CryptoNote is essentially the protocol that Monero is based on. As and you can see from this diagram, when you make a transaction with crypto nodes with Monero with the Monero, you can pick which public keys do you want to use in a combination with your public key. So Andrew Miller in his paper, he brings up two major problems with the way that mixins are selected. One is a chain reaction problem and the second is a timing problem. We'll first start by discussing the chain reaction problem. Basically, this is the situation that we ended off with last time, where I cr created a wanted to create a new signature, and I used Ronan and George's public keys in order to obfuscate my transaction. But now, what happens if I go ahead, if Ronan goes ahead and creates his own transaction, but doesn't use any mixings? Essentially, yeah. So basically, he decided to create essentially a Bitcoin-like transaction where he doesn't obfuscate his transaction at all. And it's with 100% certainty that he used his uh, B out in transaction F. But now how does that affect, the problem is that affects my transaction as well. Because now any onlooker can see with 100% probability that Ronan engaged in transaction F, with that output means he could not have partaken in transaction E. So essentially what we see is that if I'm looking from an helicopter view again, now I know for sure that out of the three public keys that were originally in the ring, one of them I can already, I already know whose it is. And I know it's Ronan. So in order to, so, so now I already left two other public keys that I have to guess 
which one is the real one and which one is the fake one. Assuming the Sonny is the real one and George is the fake one in that case. And now if George went ahead and created his own transaction with no mix-ins, it would basically get rid of his uh, likelihood in my transaction as well, giving me a 100% chance of having made that transaction. And, and you can think about it this way. So if, we, if, if Sonny wants to send out a transaction, he's not going to choose an output that's already being spent. So if he knows that Ronan already spent his, 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 um, his output or his, his coin or his money, for example, he's not going to choose Ronan to be combined with his ring. He's going to choose people who haven't, been, uh, who haven't spent their transaction yet. But the problem is, is that later on, after Sonny already used Ronan in, his, in the ring, uh, Ronan can then actually spend the transaction uh, like, uh, with a Bitcoin style uh, transaction. Therefore, it actually hurts Sonny, but although Sonny didn't plan that this is going to be the case. And the problem is that for a good period of time, almost 65% of all Monero transactions were not using any mixins because the most popular desktop client had a default setting of no mixins. So this actually compromised the privacy of the entire network significantly. So, but now the question is, does this mean that I cannot use anyone else's transaction because there's a chance that they might not be using mixins? Well, let's see what happens if they are using mixins. So let's say Ronan went ahead and created his own transaction and used uh, the two mixins as well. Now there's a 33% chance that Ronan had created this new transaction, but there's also a 33% chance that Ronan was the partaker in the in my transaction. So the question, the thing is that if everyone agrees to use mixins, it just introduces so many variables and complications into the system that it's essentially impossible for anyone to tell. And so if everyone's doing a decent number of mix-ins, the number of paths grow um, rapidly with the more mix-ins that are happening. And there's a very high number of possible ways that transaction could have been done. So that was essentially the basis of the chain reaction problem. Now we'll go ahead and discuss the second problem that Andrew Miller brings up. It's the timing problem. Essentially, what we see is that naturally, the users that make more transactions will tend to make transactions at a faster rate. So, so it's natural that for most transactions, the real inputs tend to be the output from a relatively recent transaction. This is because people who are using a network more often tend to spend money quickly after they receive it. And so these graphs uh, show some empirical evidence from uh, Miller's white paper. So if we look at the chart on the left, a. It, chart A, it shows the age distribution of input transactions. And so on the bottom x-axis, we have the age of a transaction uh, transaction input before it was spent. Um, so essentially the age distribution is that assuming I send Sunny a transaction today, how long it takes until he's gonna spend the same, the money that I send him, essentially. That's the age distribution. So now if we look at chart B, we this is actually using the previous method, uh, the chain reaction problem. There are some transactions that we can provably say are false inputs, right? So th what this graph actually does, chart B, the middle one, is graphs only the ones that have been provably shown to be false. And as we can see, these tend to be on the tail end of the distribution. And then in chart C, if we remove all the provably false ones from the overall distribution, we're left with a distribution that tends to be more of the real transactions. And as we can see, most of these transactions are uh, skewed towards the younger side of the age distribution. And essentially the whole point of this is it's to give empirical evidence that in fact, real transactions tend to be very young. And Miller goes on in his white paper to prove that in almost 80% of all Monero transactions, 
the most recent of the five input transactions tends to be the real one. Are there any questions on this before we continue? Yeah, I have one real quick. Just a second. I hope we have an answer. So you said that 80% uh, were from the most recent. That includes zero mixing, correct? Um, well, can you repeat that? So you said that 80% are from, uh, or but you can trace the most recent one that was spent. Does that include zero mix in the transactions? Um, I don't think so. I'm, I, I'm pretty sure that the 80% is from um, of transactions that include one or more mix-ins. And also, um, there is a really, there is, you, we're going to talk about the timeline. Um, there is really a timeline on when, so before, we're going to talk about it in a second, but you're going to see that it really depends on when those transactions were made. So oh, after 2000, January 2017, uh, things have changed a lot. Um, and then also throughout 2016, there's a few upgrades that kind of uh, change this uh, probability of, of actually finding the transactions. Uh, but we're going to talk about this in a second. All right, thanks guys. You can carry on. Sure. So this is basically a rough timeline of some solutions. So the thing is, these problems that Andrew Miller has presented are not new problems. They've actually been known within the Monero community for a couple of years now, actually. What Andrew Miller really did was show the severity of these problems by doing an in-depth data analysis. And so, yes, the timeline problem was known, but what was unknown was that it compromised almost 80% of all transactions. And so over the course of the past few years, Monero has actually been pushing updates to solve some of these problems. And these are some of the major solutions, which I will go into. So let's start by the talking about solving the mix-in problem. So in version zero, desktop clients had a default mix-in set to zero, which means that a high number of all Monero transactions were not using mixins. And then in version 0 0.9, it implemented a mandatory, all new transactions had a mandatory two mixin requirement. And so what we can see from the graph on the right, figure five, is once the number of, um, once the number of transactions that we not using mixins dropped after this update, we see that the number of, that's, the, that's represented by the blue line. It went from around 70% down to close to 0%. Um, the number of compromised transactions dropped from 95% to almost 20%. That's the gray line. And the reason it only went to 20% though, instead of 0%, is because new transactions could still be referencing older transactions that um, had zero mixings. And so how did we get around solving this is in version 0.1, it impl Monero implemented a new feature called ring CT, which it was designed for a completely different purpose of hiding the denomination amounts of coin sent, but it had a little bit of the side effect of that all ring CT transactions could only use other ring CT transactions as inputs. And because ring CT was implemented after this two mixin mandatory, all new transactions, because all new transactions are ring CT, are only referencing transactions that are um, also ring CT, which have at least two mixins. So all new transactions essentially do not suffer from the chain reaction problem as severely. And this has essentially solved the problem. So any transaction that's been created after January 5th of 2017 is uh, protected by this ring CT uh, solution. So if you have any Monero coins, you should just um, um, <laughs> just trade them for the new ones, and you're probably gonna be fine. <laughs> now, how do we? What about the timing problem? So in version zero, uh, it took a uniform distribution that there was an equal chance of any coin from of any age being selected. Right? And this caused a huge problem where, like I said, uh, under the uniform distribution, almost 95% of the time, a uh, transaction was from the uh, newest transaction. So essentially, uniform distribution mixing is saying that every transaction has the same likelihood of being picked. So 
um, if, if Sunny send me a transaction in back in version zero, um, he can choose any of the old transactions uh, throughout the history, which we know that in version zero, most of them had zero mixing. So it was much easier to trace back whose Sunny transaction is, which one is the real one versus the fake one. And it gave a priority to an older uh, transactions to be included in the rings. So the Monero developers recognized that this was a problem. So what they did was they implemented a new strategy called the triangular mix-in strategy. And what essentially this does is it created a system that favors new transaction inputs as mix-ins. And so it's called the triangular strategy because it is the, it's represented by the graph on top and it has a rough triangular shape where newer uh, transactions, this time the graph is actually reversed, uh, things on farther on the right represent newer transactions. These are more likely to be chosen. However, what Andrew Miller did was with his empirical evidence, this is the graph from the previous slide, just flip horizontally to match the top one, is that he showed that yes, the triangular mixing strategy helped, but it is still not nearly as skewed as the reality of the situation. And essentially the triangular mixing strategy underestimated the skewness of age distributions. So there has been work to further fix the triangular distribution problem where there's a new mix in selection policy uh, in version 0.1.1. And in this, at least new strategy, at least 25% of mixins have to be from what's called the recent zone, which is transactions that occurred in the last five days. This should hopefully help solve the problem a little bit, but um, this feature has been developed but hasn't been activated yet, so it's yet to be seen how this fares in practice. Andrew, however, comes up with his own solution to the timing problem. He basically says that the triangular distribution is a lack of knowledge distribution. It's a de number of developers trying to predict what the distribution of the network is going to look like and create a model that matches it. But what he says now is, hey, look, I've done a lot of data analysis and I figured out the real distribution of real Monero data from the past few years of Monero transactions. Now that we have a real what a uh, distribution that matches reality, we can do some level of data-driven design and basically create a distribution that matches the one that we see in reality. And he also suggests that beyond just using a fixed distribution, we can also in the long run even implement newer software into wallets that every interval, let's say every two weeks, it recreates the distribution of the past few, two weeks of data and adjust its sampling um, strategy based on the real data of the last few weeks. And so this will make it adaptive to changes in the network. So the question now is, is Monero really anonymous? And we're gonna say a resounding yes, because essentially the crypto note protocol is and has always been uh, secure. Uh, and the problem that Andrew Miller presented was really in the Select, mix and selection strategy. Of the two problems he mentions, the chain reaction problem has effectively been solved, and the timing problem is in the process of being solved by Monero developers, and there's been a lot of criticism and politics, I'd say, about, oh, Andrew Miller is on the board of Zcash, is he trying to hurt Monero? But as we can see, I, we, I, we really believe that he was actually doing something to help the overall industry because not only did he bring up problems, he presented legitimate and valid solutions to these. And so if we actually take what Andrew Miller wrote and like try to implement more adaptive solutions, we can increase the anonymity of Monero even farther. So yes, we believe that Monero still remains extremely anonymous and is a valid contender in the realm of privacy coins. So yeah, thank you so much for uh, letting us speak. Um, I know that might have been a lot of um, knowledge. Um, we'll be happy to help. Um, actually, we're supposed to give away Bitcoin, but it didn't happen today. Uh, we have our wallets with us, and we cannot send it over. I'll bring it. I'll bring it when we get to when I get to Greece. Uh, actually, don't be following up with.
uh, some practical demonstrations here and sharing bitcoins with the crowd here. So we've got that covered for you. <laughs> Great. Thanks I'll send you. for a very interesting presentation and hoping to see you here anytime you can make it. Thank you very much. Thanks. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, let us know. Do we have any questions? One question back there. Give me a second. Okay, so hello first. Um, my question is that these, uh, the analysis that was presented in the paper was of a statistical nature. Uh, but if I want to protect my own transactions, how do I, um, I mean, how does this relate to my own transactions? I want to make sure that my transactions are not traceable. So do these statistical results have a, uh, an effect on my level of privacy when I do transactions. I mean, what does it actually mean for somebody to actually track an amount moving through different uh, transactions? Yeah, sure. So essentially, um, if you want to make sure your personal transactions are as anonymous as possible, um, the number one thing you should be doing is just make sure you're using the latest version of the client and protocol. You want to make sure you're not using the older desktop client that has zero mix-in uh, basis. You want to make sure you're using Ring CT such that, which, like we said, now you can only use transactions that don't do mix in, that that do mix-ins. So if you do that, that will actually reduce your uh, increase your anonymity by a significant percentage, and. Um, in the uh, client, it by default uses, the, the default client that Monero publishes uses the triangular distribution, but there are opportunities for anyone to create newer clients, or I'm not quite sure if there are any other alternative clients out there that use a different distribution strategy. Um, but, so yeah, if, if you want to create your own distribution uh, strategy, that uh, you could, that's a possibility. But really, I think the biggest thing is just make sure you're constantly updating the, to the latest software and getting the latest security fixes. Or you can use Zcash, maybe. That's another <laughs> option. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, actually, um, the question I was asking wasn't about more like what I can actually do to make my transaction private, but in the sense that, okay, I go to the blockchain and I make a transaction. Yeah. Does this paper help me? track this transaction through the blockchain as it flows forward? Um, that is a question. Yeah, so another thing that you should you could do if you want to maximize the, your, the anonymity is in the Monero client, you can choose the number of mixins you do. And in the latest version, the default is actually four, but you can get up, you can set it to up to 12 mixins, for example. And if you increase the mixins, um, Miller does a analysis of this in his paper, where if you increase the number of mixins, you can increase the anonymity significantly because now you're uh, decreasing, you're increasing your plausible deniability. But on the other hand, you have to weigh that with the fact that if you increase the number of mixins, you're using more public keys in your ring signature, which will increase the size of your signature which will mean your transaction will be larger and you'll have to pay higher uh, transaction fees. Mm -hmm. But this is uh, sort of a cost benefit that you have to do of transaction fees versus desired anonymity. Did that answer your question? Yeah. 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 Essentially, essentially, the Monero, it's, it's like very much like other currencies. It's much like a network effect. So if more people are using it, more people are mixing, it creates a better anonymity. Um, if less people are using it, less people are mixing, there is like much less anonymity. Um, so if you are, like Sunny said, if you are uh, planning on, on using it for, I don't know what you want to use it for, but if you try to stay anonymous, um, try to uh, yeah have as many mixing as possible. I think the cost benefit actually makes sense if you, if you don't want to be traced back. Uh, but again, we haven't done our own research on this topic. So, you know, things might happen and things might come up that we're not aware of yet. Um, so just keep that in mind. 
also Zcash, uh, for those who are familiar with, they have um, a, a, the privacy feature, but most of them are not being, uh, uh, unless, you, unless you choose the feature, it's not private. Um, so just also come something to keep in mind for, um, for future references. Thank you so much for having us. Another quick question. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about groups in Berkeley, what type of organization you are, uh, who is your member state, uh, who is your audience, and so on? Sorry, can you repeat? Tell them about blockchain in Berkeley. Oh. So, yeah, so Blockchain in Berkeley, um, our mission is essentially to educate and bring awareness to the industry. We have three different departments that we're doing. One of them is the R&D, which Sunny is in charge of. It's more working professors, PhD students, master students that work on research and, you know, protocol level consensus, um, different, different papers that we actually push the industry forward. Uh, we have the education where we teach uh, a two-unit class that you can take at UC Berkeley towards your degree. It's a blockchain and cryptocurrency. You guys can watch it on our website. Um, if you look at blockchain.berkeley.edu slash decal, D-E-C-A-L. Um, this is our class. It's open source. Uh, it's mainly uh, an abstract of, of how Bitcoin works, how Ethereum works, how the blockchain works. Um, really the basics, technical aspect that people need to know to really be knowledgeable in the space. And then besides that, we have another two, uh, two workshops that we're teaching. One for business people that want to learn how to consult in a space. And another one is for Ethereum development that we did this semester. Next semester, we're going to work with IBM and, and create a an Hyperledger uh, workshop. And then our third department is the consulting. When we work with companies like Airbus, like ExxonMobil, um, when we actually go and build products for them, we build pilots. So this semester we work with Airbus. We created a, a smart contract modularity that people can, that the engineers can use without actually understand how the blockchain works. Um, some of it, I think, is going to be open source. So once we open source it, people can play around with it and see what we did. Um, and then now we're working uh, on top of that uh, for more education uh, for executive level. So we, te we go to companies like uh, consulting companies as well as uh, Fortune 500 companies. We teach the education, the education to the executive level. We kind of ex expose them to the industry, expose them to technology, what it can do for them, how they can, how they can use it for future benefits, and or how it's going to take them out of business. Um, yeah, that's overall. That sounds great, guys. Personally, I didn't know about you and your initiative so far. So, on behalf of the university, I will be contacting you to see what, explore what further collaboration space exists. Yeah. So, uh, until then, I want to thank you very much for taking the time and giving us a rundown on a very important topic, which I'm, I'm sure is going to be more important as time passes and people become aware of the importance of privacy, especially in the blockchain space. So we're, we're hoping to see you live whenever you manage to get down here or we'll be happy to host you in another week up. Yeah, I'll be there in <laughs> June. Okay guys, thanks very much. Thank you so much. Aristopoli. <laughs> Bye-bye.